tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The prophecy we're studying today is one of the most critical prophecies of the entire Bible. Without the right understanding about this prophecy, it's impossible to really grasp the entire scope of the prophecies that God has given to us. This prophecy is entitled, Holy Roman Empire Reborn. It actually came to pass on November the 3rd of 2009. This was one of the five most important prophetic fulfillments in the last 2,000 years, ever since the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One reason this prophecy is so absolutely important is because the Antichrist and the false prophet will both come out of this reborn Holy Roman Empire. So if we acquire an understanding of the Holy Roman Empire, we can know what's really happening in our world today. Now, the prophecy about the Holy Roman Empire reborn is given to us two different times in the Scripture. One of the times is depicted as a woman riding on the back of a beast. It's interesting that the emblem outside the capital of the European Union in Brussels, Belgium, outside the Parliament building, and you can see it here, is a bull with a woman, Europa, riding on the back. Well, in the scripture given to us to describe this very entity, and this scripture was given to us uh, 2,500 years ago, it uses the same type of symbolism, the woman on the back of the beast. It's nothing short of remarkable. Now, the prophecy is found in Daniel chapter number 2, verse 31 through 45. In order for us to really appreciate this prophecy, we need to take a moment to give the setting. This was the time of Israel's captivity to the Babylonians. This was happening because Israel had sinned and God's judgment was, I'm going to drive you into exile for 70 years. Among the first to go into exile was Daniel and the three Hebrew children. Very quickly, Daniel was found among the spiritual advisors to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Now, we need to understand that Babylon ruled the entire world of its day. So immediately, Daniel was thrust into a very important position. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar went to bed one evening and had a dream. Upon awakening the next morning, he remembered that he had dreamed a dream. It just really bothered him. He felt like it was an important dream, but he couldn't remember what he dreamed. Have you ever had the experience? Well, that's what happened to him. However, King Nebuchadnezzar was used to getting his way, and he thought, you know, I've been paying those astrologers and those wise men. I feed them every day. They're all on payroll. It's time for them to earn their money. So he sent for the chief among the wise men and said, I had a dream last evening. And the wise men said, oh, no problem at all. You just tell us the dream, O king, and we'll tell you the interpretation thereof. Nebuchadnezzar said, well, that's where the problem is. I don't remember what I dreamed. I want you to tell me the dream and what it means. Well, now the chief wise man was very alarmed. He said, oh, king, no one has ever required this of his spiritual advisors before. Well, Nebuchadnezzar said, just what I thought. You're all a bunch of fakes. You're all a bunch of charlatans. I'm not feeding you another meal. And he issued the order on the spot to kill all the wise men in his realm. Well, this was bad news, of course. And they came to Daniel's home, knocked on his door, and said, we're here to uh, put you to death. Well, that's shocking news. So Daniel said, wait a minute. Um, I don't mind dying. I'm ready to die. But please tell me what this is all about. So they quickly related the story. Daniel said, stop your extermination program because I can't tell the king his dream, but I serve a God who reveals the secrets of men's hearts, and he can. And I'm going to seek him, and he's going to tell me the dream, and I will then tell it to King Nebuchadnezzar. Well, everyone breathed a sigh of relief, hoping that Daniel could, in fact, do this. Well, Daniel sent for his three 
friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew children, they fasted, they prayed. That evening, Daniel went to bed and dreamed a dream. When he awakened the next morning, he knew God had allowed him to dream Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And furthermore, God had given him the understanding of what it meant. So Daniel is quickly ushered into the presence of King Nebuchadnezzar to tell him the dream and the interpretation thereof. Now, I imagine there was a lot of apprehension in the palace that day in the throne room. Uh, everyone was hoping that this young Jewish man that had come from Jerusalem in the captivity could really give the dream and the interpretation thereof. So this is what happened next. Daniel began to relate the dream. He said, what you really saw, King Nebuchadnezzar, you saw an image. And the image had a head of gold, arms and breasts of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron mingled with clay. And as you watched, a stone came rolling down out of the mountain, smote the image on the feet, and the whole image came crumbling down. It disintegrated, became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and was carried away by the wind. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar was astounded because have you ever forgotten something and then someone jogged your memory? Well, that's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. As soon as Daniel began to tell him the dream, he began to remember the dream. And he said, Daniel, this is incredible. The God that you serve truly is able to reveal the secrets of men's hearts. So now Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the entire world, realizes there really is a true God and there really are people who are in touch with that true God. And so this set the stage for many other things that would happen later on in Daniel's life in the kingdom of Babylon. But as Daniel explained the dream to Nebuchadnezzar, he began to fill in the details, fill in the blanks. And here's what he said. He said, first of all, these different segments, the head of gold, the arms and breasts of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, the feet of iron mingled with clay, all symbolize empires. And they're not just any empires. They are empires starting with now until the, the coming of God to establish his kingdom upon the earth. These are empires that will rule the entire world. There will be many empires between now and then, but only five will obtain world dominion. And that's the reason there are five segments, sections of this image. Verse 39 of Daniel 2 actually gives us that clue. Listen to it. And after thee, Nebuchadnezzar, shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass. And here's the salient phrase, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So that's the qualifier. To be in this prophecy, the kingdoms have to bear rule over all the earth. So then Daniel goes ahead to give the explanation. He said, you, O Nebuchadnezzar, and your kingdom of Babylon, you are the head of gold. And the whole world looks to you for leadership. But that won't go on forever. Because after you, there's going to arise another kingdom. Now, we know how this came to pass. It was in the days of Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. Belshazzar was having a big feast. Now, in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, he had conquered Jerusalem and he had carried away the golden and the silver vessels that had been dedicated to the service of God in the temple. But in respect to Daniel and his God, Nebuchadnezzar had never done anything with these vessels. He simply put them in storage and left them there. However, Nebuchadnezzar did not pass his values on to his grandson. And so Belshazzar is partying one evening. And when Belshazzar partied as the king of the whole world, uh, he had big, amazing parties. So Belshazzar's partying, but by this time, he'd been through this so much. The booze was there, the drugs were there, but the party was sort of dragging. And Belshazzar thought, you know, I've got to take this to another level. He thought, what can I do? And he remembered those golden and those silver vessels that had never been touched, that were off limits. He decides he's going to push it to the edge. And he gives the order, go bring those vessels. We're going to use those to party with tonight. So they did. And undoubtedly, they got the most beautiful golden goblet for Belshazzar. They filled it to the brim with the finest wine. 
And the Bible says, when he tipped the glass to his lips, there came a scratching, scratching sound over at, to his right. And he turned to see. When he did, he saw the forefinger of a man's hand inscribing in the plaster in the wall a message. Now, let me tell you, that'll bring any good party to a screeching halt. Immediately, the people saw it, and they began to head for the exits. And Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible says, his knees began to smite together in fear. He ordered a halt to the music. He said, someone, bring someone that can tell me what this means. Well, nobody could tell them. It was written in a different language than Belshazzar could read. So they began to put out the call. Is there anybody that can tell us? Someone stepped forward and said, O oh, king, I remember in the day of your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream that no one could reveal. But there was this man in the realm. His name was Daniel. He was of the Hebrews. And he told your grandfather the dream and the interpretation of the dream. I think he probably could help us here. Immediately they sent for Daniel. And when they sent for Daniel, he came before uh, Belshazzar. And there he gave Belshazzar the meaning. He said, first of all, the meaning is meany, menial, tekel, eupharson. That's the handwriting. Here's what it means. You are weighed in the balance and you are found wanting. This night, your kingdom will be divided between the Medes and the Persians. Well, that's exactly what happened. It happened in 539 BC. That's when the Medes and the Persians, that very night, they were in the process of invading. They overthrew the kingdom of Babylon that night. And from 539 BC until 331 BC, the Medes and the Persians ruled the entire world. Well, the prophecy goes on to say, there's another segment. So let's review. Head of gold, Babylon, arms and breasts of silver, the Medes and the Persians. But now then, let's look at the belly and thighs of brass. Alexander the Great came stampeding through the land in 331 BC. He conquered the empire of the Medes and the Persians. Alexander the Great actually conquered the known world of his day. By the time he was only 30 years of age. Can you imagine that? And when he finally conquered the last outpost of resistance, history tells us he sat down and wept that there were no more worlds to conquer because he loved war more than anything. So that began the kingdom of the Grecians. And Greece ruled the world for the next couple of hundred years from 331 BC until about 197 BC. It was in 197 BC that the Romans defeated the Grecians and began to rule. Now the Romans were symbolized in the prophecy about all these world empires as the legs of iron. The Roman Empire was the strongest. It lasted the longest from 197 B.C. until around 284 A.D. The Romans ruled the entire world. It was the Romans that ruled the world during the time of Jesus Christ. That's the reason there were Roman soldiers at the crucifixion of Jesus. Those were occupying forces that were there to enforce the will of the Roman government on the people of Israel. That's the reason the people would come to Jesus and say, should we pay? the Roman tax. And of course, he knew it was a trick that he, if he said no, that the Romans would come and arrest him and take him away for rebellion against the empire. So he just said, bring me a penny. They did. He said, whose inscription? They said, it's Caesar's picture on there. He said, okay, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render under, unto God the things that are God's. Now we come to the most important part of this prophecy. Notice when you move from each segment of the image, there's a total change of metal every time from gold to silver to brass to iron until you get to the last segment. You move from the legs of iron to the feet of iron mingled with clay. Now, this is very important because this time there's not a total change. This really helps us understand what the last empire is going to be. Because the last empire is not going to be the Roman Empire, but it's going to be related to the Roman Empire. The Roman element is kept as we move from 300 AD 
until finally 800 A.D. because it was in 800 A.D. that the Holy Roman Empire was born. Now, the Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire are not the same empire. The Roman Empire was a totally secular empire, but the Holy Roman Empire, as it names, the, depicts, is to be a union, an alliance of church and state, of politics and religion. The Holy Roman Empire was actually born in 800 A.D. when Pope Leo III placed the crown on the head of Charlemagne, announcing that he was now the emperor of, watch this, the Holy Roman Empire. So when the Bible depicts the feet of iron mingled with clay, the iron was the Roman element, but the clay was the religious element. Now they're joined together, and that's what happened on December the 25th, 800 A.D., when Pope Leo III put the crown on the head of Charlemagne. Now, from that time on, the Holy Roman Empire ruled the world pretty much for the next 1,000 years. And the leaders that ruled the Holy Roman Empire were always dual, a dual leadership, always the political leader from Europe and the spiritual leader every single time from Italy. It was a combination of the political leader and the spiritual leader. And of course, the spiritual leader was always the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church of the Vatican. So this is depicting the Holy Roman Empire. Now, do you notice how the iron is now carried over from Roman Empire to Holy Roman Empire? And that empire continued for the next 1,000 years or so. Now, in the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2, it ultimately says that this stone comes rolling down out of the mountain and smites the image on the feet. That's a critical insight because it tells us the stone coming down out of the mountain represents the kingdom of God coming, and he's going to come and destroy all of the governments of men. Many places in Scripture, we are taught that mankind will be allowed to rule himself until the time of the kingdom of God. Once mankind has been given time to learn that he doesn't know how to rule himself, then the Bible says God will come, put down the thrones of men, and establish his kingdom, a kingdom that will never pass away and never be destroyed. Well, that's what's depicted here by the stone rolling down on the mountain. It smites the image where? It smites the image on the feet. The feet were iron made with clay. The the iron mingled with clay symbolizes the Holy Roman Empire. So this tells us that the Holy Roman Empire has to be in power at the time of the Messiah coming to put down the thrones of men and to establish his kingdom. This teaches us that Jesus will return to this earth during the time of the Holy Roman Empire. However, a lot of people say the Holy Roman Empire ceased to exist in 1806 with the last empire uh, decaying, the last element of the Holy Roman Empire. But it's not true. You and I have watched the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire over the last 50 years, and most people did not even know what they were seeing. But we're going to understand it as we continue on through this lesson. Now, notice what it says in verse number 44 of Daniel chapter number 2. It states there, after talking about the feet and the toes of the image, it says, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. In the days of what kings? It just says this in verse 44. Well, it's talking about the days of the kings symbolized by the ten toes. The ten toes are the very last part of this entire world government structure from the time of 600 B.C. until the second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth to establish his kingdom. It's taught about the ten kings that will be in coalition and support the Antichrist at the the end time, at the time when Jesus Christ is to return to the earth. Now, the big question is, am I simply asserting this, or is there biblical truth that that, in fact, is the interpretation of this prophecy? Well, let's go to another place in Scripture to get absolute proof that this is true. In Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 12, there's another prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
only here it depicts the ten king alliance that will support the Antichrist as ten horns instead of ten toes. Now the ten toes of Daniel 2 verse 44 are the exact same thing as the ten horns. It symbolizes the last ten nation union that will give its support to the person who will rule the end time world government right before the second coming of Jesus. That person, of course, is the Antichrist. Let's read the passage of Revelation 17. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but they will receive power as kings one hour with the beast. The beast here is the end time world government and the Antichrist, that world leader that will rule the end time world government. These 10 kings receive power as kings one hour with the Antichrist. Now, does this literally mean 60 seconds when it says one hour? Of course not. It's a figure of speech. It's saying for a very short segment of time, these 10 kings will receive power for a very short period of time. And these have one mind they shall give their power and strength unto the beast. We can already see what it means when it says one mind, like today. We hear a lot of people talking about the world community says Iran must do this or someone else must do this because there has now been a common mind established. Well, that's the way this is going to work, only it's going to become more and more pronounced as we get closer and closer to the second coming. So these have one mind and they give their power voluntarily and their strength unto the end time world dictator that we know of as the Antichrist. However, it goes on to say in verse 14 of Revelation chapter number 17, it says there that these 10 kings shall make war with the lamb. Now, who is the lamb? We all know that answer. Jesus Christ is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So when Jesus Christ comes to establish his kingdom, these 10 kings in alliance with the Antichrist, they're actually going to fight against Jesus Christ at the time of his coming. These shall make war with the Lamb, Jesus Christ. You remember what John the Baptist said when Jesus came on the scene to be baptized? Remember, John looked up and saw him coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is the lamb. And when he comes back, they're going to actually resist him. And the Bible says, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now, when Jesus comes back, by then we will have met him in the air. We will, the people who are part of the church of Jesus Christ, those who are born again, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We will then go with him. He's going to come down to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem for the battle of Armageddon. And that's where the world empires are going to resist Jesus Christ. Christ, but he will overcome them because he is Lord of all lords. He is king of all kings. And those with him are going to be called and chosen and faithful. Now, this is really important. If you want to be with him, now everybody is called. The Bible says many are called, but then it says few are chosen. Once you're called, then you need to conform your life to Jesus Christ and learn how to be his true disciple and walk with him. And then after you're called and after you're chosen, then it's critical that you be faithful. So we've looked at the prophecy foretelling the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire. I said to you early in today's lesson that this actually has already happened. In the next segment, of end of the age, you're actually going to see the details of how this prophecy has been fulfilled. I mean, this is absolutely incredible that you and I just witnessed this great prophetic fulfillment in recent times. It actually happened November the 3rd of 2009, one of the five greatest prophetic fulfillments in the last 2,000 years. And you know, the amazing thing is most of the world didn't even know it happened. They did not know one of the most important prophecies of the Bible took place. 
But yet, if you understand the Bible, you didn't know. You kept track of it. You realized, I have just witnessed one of the greatest prophetic fulfillments in the last 2,000 years. You know, that happened the first coming of Jesus Christ. At his first coming, there were 100 specific prophecies, and he fulfilled every one of them. But most people totally missed it, just like most people missed the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire that just happened recently. They missed it. Why? Because they did not know the prophecies and they did not understand the prophecies. So in summary, what's important for us to remember about this Holy Roman Empire prophecy, the feet of iron made with clay? It's critical for us to know that there will be two leaders of this Holy Roman Empire. There's always been a political leader and a spiritual leader. And in the next segment, you're going to find out that there will once again be a spiritual leader and a political leader. Only according to the prophecy, the political leader will be the Antichrist and the spiritual leader will be the false prophet. That's so important for us to realize that. In the last segment of End of the Age, we studied the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2 about the Holy Roman Empire, and we proved that Jesus Christ will return to earth during the reign of the Holy Roman Empire, and that the Antichrist and the false prophet will in fact come from this reborn Holy Roman Empire. Now, we contended last segment that this has already now happened, that the Holy Roman Empire is now reborn. Now we want to explain. Here's what happened concerning the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire. After World War II, the empires of Europe lay in ashes because of the plunder of Nazi Germany and of World War II. Great Britain, Germany, France, Italy, all the big powers of Europe were reduced to rubble. Now, these were the old traditional powers that ran the world, however. They didn't want to be left outside of the power equation of the world to come. There were two emerging nuclear superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States of America. Winston Churchill foresaw that there had to be a radical realignment or else Europe would become irrelevant. He actually proposed in a speech shortly after World War II was over that there would be established a United States of Europe. He said in this day of the nuclear superpower, it takes 200 million population in order to have the population base and the economic resources to play ball in the day of the nuclear superpower. He said, we either forget our differences and unify as one in Europe, creating a United States of Europe, he actually used that term, or else all of the power will move to the Soviet Union and the United States of America. Well, the old proud states of Europe were used to playing a central role in world affairs, and they did not want to be shunted to the side of history. Consequently, they made a decision. In 1957, there was a treaty signed called the Treaty of Rome. They created, with the signing of the Treaty of Rome, what's called the common market. The first goal was economic union, but that was not the ultimate goal. The leaders knew that economic union had to come first, but political union was sure to follow because once you join entities together economically, they have to pass laws to control and regulate their interaction, and ultimately you would build a body of laws that would become a political union as well as an economic union. So this was all set in motion by six nations. They signed the Treaty of Rome in 1957. Many others of the nations of Europe doubted that it would work, so they sat on the sidelines. However, it worked better than most people thought it could. Quickly, other people lined up to join this common market. They started with six, then there became nine, then there was 10, then there was 12, then there was 15. By 1992, all of the economic barriers were down so that you could raise crops in Germany and sell them in France, just like you could raise crops in Indiana and sell them in Illinois. 
all tariffs, all economic barriers were gone by 1992. And some people said, success. But the real leaders said, no, that's only phase one. Immediately, they called another meeting at Maastricht, Holland, and they formed a new treaty called the Maastricht Treaty. The goal of this treaty was to go from economic union to political union. Well, by 1999, they had their common money, the euro. All of you are familiar with the euro. By then, the European Union, by 2004, the European Union expanded to 25 member states. We're talking about 25 nations have now merged their economies, plus many of them had gotten rid of their money and adopted the common money of Europe, the euro. And by 2007, there were 27 members in what became known as the European Union. It wasn't the common market anymore because that phase was over. They now took upon themselves the name, the European Union. And by 2007, they were the world's number one economic power. They had 500 million population with the greatest economic might on the face of the planet. Now, that was where they were at that point, but the, the mission was not yet completed. We want to pause right now to ask this question because I'm painting the scenario here that I'm asking you to believe that the European Union was really the prophesied rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire, of the prophesied Holy Roman Empire, out of which the Antichrist, the false prophet, will soon emerge. Now, is that really true or am I simply reading something into this that's not there. Well, they decided they would start printing money. Their first money was printed in 1987, a coin called the ECU, the European Currency Unit. And when they decided to print their first money as the European Union, they were looking for someone's picture that would really convey the meaning of what was going on. I wonder, can you guess whose picture they chose to symbolize what was really taking place? Well, here's a copy of the coin. You can see it for yourself. They put the picture of Charlemagne. Remember, he was the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Pope Leo III placed the crown on his head on Christmas Day, December 25, 800 AD. Now they decide to put his picture on their first coin. Was it because they understood that they were actually presiding over the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire? You better believe. Now, that's not the only proof we have because they decided about this time that they would award a prize annually for the states person in the world that had done the most that year to promote European unification, the realization of their United States of Europe dream. They were looking for a name for this prize for European unification. And can you guess what they decided the prize should be called? Well, here it is. It's the Charlemagne Prize. It's given every year. Uh, right now, you can see a picture of President Clinton. He received the Charlemagne Prize in the year 2000. Why? Because... There was a problem with Yugoslavia. Europe had to have Yugoslavia as part of its United States of Europe, as part of its European Union. But Slobodan Milosevic didn't want to lose sovereignty, and he resisted being melted into the European Union. So he had to be removed. Well, President Clinton led the charge. He used the forces of NATO, and he took Slobodan Milosevic out of power. He ended up on trial before the World Court in The Hague. And today, you guessed it, Yugoslavia is now a part of the European Union. And President Clinton was given the prize for that. Uh, actually, there were some interesting things said at the coronation of Clinton for that year's Charlemagne Prize. By the way, he went to Aachen, Germany, where the prize is awarded, and that's the home of Charlemagne. Still standing in Aachen is the cathedral he built in 800 AD, and you actually see, see President Clinton there receiving the prize. And listen to some of the things that Clinton said in his acceptance speech. The job of building a united Europe is certainly not finished. 
And it is important not to take all this self-congratulation too far, Clinton said, in becoming only the third American to receive the prestigious International Charlemagne Prize for promoting European unity. So Clinton understood fully what this prize was about. He understood what he was doing when he led the charge against Slobodan Milosevic, and he understood he got the prize for bringing Yugoslavia into the United States of Europe. Well, that's not all. Not only do we have the picture of Charlemagne on the first coin, not only do we have the Charlemagne Prize, but the most influential publication in Europe is a periodical called The Economist. Some people refer to it as the periodical of kings and presidents. It's by far the most influential periodical in Europe. It's owned by Lord Rothschild. It comes out weekly. And The Economist magazine has now devoted over the past many years since the common market thrust was begun. They have devoted one page each week, each issue, to European unification, to the latest developments that week toward European unification. Now, can you possibly guess what they call this special page every week? Are you catching on yet? Here it is. They call it the Charlemagne page. Okay, do these people know what they're doing? Do they not? Oh, by the way, other nations are still lining up to join because the European Union is becoming more and more powerful, not only as an economic entity, but as a political union in the world. And many people still are making application to become a part of the European Union. Well, when they want to present their application, there is a special building in Brussels, which is the capital of the European Union. At Brussels, Belgium, there's a special building where they must apply and also where they must go to conduct the intricate negotiations required for them to become members of the European Union. Is there a chance that you might be able to guess what they call the building where they have to go to apply for membership in the European Union? Well, there it is. If you guessed Charlemagne building, then you are right. So the question is, do these people know what they're doing? Charlemagne on their first money? Charlemagne prize? Charlemagne page in the Economist magazine? Charlemagne building where you go? Hey, I think they know what they're doing. I think they know that they are presiding over the rebirth of of the Holy Roman Empire. Now there's one more thing that you need to look at because you can't have a nation unless you have a flag. Well, they have one. Here's their flag. If you look in the upper portion, you will see a blue flag with 12 gold stars superimposed on the flag. Now immediately we say, what's that mean? Why do they have 12 stars? Somebody said, well, the US flag, if we have 50 states, we have 50 stars. When we had 48 states, we had 48 stars. But they don't have 12 states. They now have 27, but they still have 12 stars. I actually asked the people at the visitor center at the parliament building in Brussels. I was on a tour there. Why do you only have 12 stars on your flag? And they looked at me dumbfounded. They said, well, we got 12 members. I said, no, you got 27 members now. They said, well, we don't know. Well, I found out why they have 12 stars. The flag designer, Mr. Arsene Heights, he's now over 80 years of age, but he designed the flag and he wrote an article explaining why he designed the flag like he did. He did this because he believed that the Holy Roman Empire should have the holy element in it. And as a devout Catholic, he believed that the woman depicted in Revelation 12, verse 1 and 2, there's a woman there giving birth to a child with 12 stars about her head. He believed that that's the Virgin Mary there in Revelation 12, and so he should take the 12 stars from her head and put them on the flag, which sends a signal to those who understand these things, Europe is under the flag of Mary. The Catholic Church is very much alive and well and a part of the Holy Roman Empire. You're looking now at a picture of the Virgin Mary with the 12 stars about her head. This was taken from a church right there in Brussels, Belgium, and all over 
Europe, you'll see the 12 stars wherever you look. Now, beyond that, it's even interesting that they now have 12 stars on all the license plates of all the members of the European Union, and they now also have 12 stars on the euro, the money. So it's everywhere, and it's the symbol of the, remember, Holy Roman Empire an alliance of church and state, of politics and religion. Now, there was one thing left that Europe needed to really be the United States of Europe or the European Union. They felt like they had to have a constitution. So they began to work on it. In October 29 of 2004, they actually signed a constitution. They got together and in the same room where the Treaty of Rome was signed to found the common market way back in 1957, they all, all the members, there were 25 at the time, they signed the Constitution. However, there was a real problem because all of the participating nations, all 25 of them, had to have a vote of all their people, and all of their people had to agree to this new constitution. Well, can you imagine trying to get unanimous agreement among 25 nations? It was almost impossible. Well, it was impossible because in 2005, France held her referendum and the French people voted it down because they knew that this was going to mean the end of French sovereignty. Shortly thereafter, the people of Holland, they voted it down. So now then, Europe was... Well, they were sent into uh, two years of reassessment. What do we do now? We thought we just about had achieved our dream of the United States of Europe. We've been working on this since World War II. We've been working on this since the founding of the Holy Roman Empire in uh, 1957. And now it looks like the whole thing has crumbled because of the short-sightedness of the French people and the Dutch people. And so they circled the wagons and thought, what can we do? However, you know how resourceful sometimes politicians can be. And some of the politicians said, you know, all is not lost. We'll never probably get enough votes to, for every single nation to approve it. But there's another way out of this impasse. You know, if we would convert this constitution to a treaty, and all of us adopt the treaty, we could get the same goal. And treaties do not require a referendum among all the people. So the idea was born. All 27 nations by now, on December the 13th of 2007, made their way to Lisbon, Portugal, and there they signed this new treaty, which everybody knew contained all the elements of the Constitution. But when is a Constitution not a Constitution? When the politicians say, oh, it's not a constitution, it's a treaty, abracadabra, we've got our problem solved. So all the nations signed. However, they still had to have ratification of the parliaments. They did not have to have a referendum, except for one problematic nation. Northern Ireland had it built in its constitution that it still had to hold a referendum. Well, nation after nation, France, Holland, they immediately started ratifying in their parliament. All's going well because now then the fate of the European Union is in the wiser hands of the politicians who know what's best for the people anyway when they don't know what's good for themselves. But when they got to the vote for Ireland, Ireland knew that this was the end of Irish sovereignty if they said yes, and they voted it down. So now we have one little nation spoiling the big dream. And quickly, the larger members of the European Union said to Ireland, if you want to stay in the European Union, you better find a way to change your vote. Well, they began to funnel money and they launched a huge public relations campaign, spent hundreds of millions of dollars, and a year or so later, the Irish people decided they better vote again. And by now, they're in the middle of the economic crisis of 2008. And they begin to think, what if we were all out here all by ourselves? We have the protection of the European Union. You know, maybe it's a good thing for us to be a part of the European Union. So the vote was held again. And sure enough, it was approved. Quickly, the few holdouts begin to ratify. And then on November the 3rd, 2009, 
the last nation to ratify was the nation of the Czech Republic. They ratified, and when they did, the Holy Roman Empire was reborn. November 3rd, 2009, the entity that is to be in power on this earth at the time of the Antichrist, the false prophet, the entity that's to be in power on this earth at the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ was born, and it is now born today. Now, we're going to a video clip right now, and you're going to actually witness the signing. Now, notice the signing is held in a monastery. Why there? That's interesting. Is that have something to do with religion and politics? Here all these political leaders are at this monastery, and you're actually going to watch as world leader after world leader places their signature on this document. Notice how historic it is. Notice how much importance they're placing in all this. And they, they're right. They know what they're doing. They know that this is a huge turning point that they are giving birth to the Holy Roman Empire once again. Watch this. Da assinatura do Tratado de This enlarged European Union. Bundesrepublik Deutschland. Finally, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. There's going to be a Mr. Europe, uh, if you like, a permanent president and a foreign minister of Europe. And those people are designed by this treaty to get more power over time so that Europe becomes more centralized, so that more power passes to Brussels away from the nation states. And we think that that is taking Europe in the wrong direction. So there you have it. You just witnessed the signing of the treaty of the Constitution of the United States of Europe. America has its Constitution. Now the European Union has its Constitution. The last member, as we stated earlier, ratified on November the 3rd, 2009. And so those people who think the Holy Roman Empire ceased to exist in 1806 are in for a big surprise because we have just witnessed over the last 50 years, the reformation and now the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, one of the things that the Lisbon Treaty provides for is once the Constitution is signed, that Europe will have its own permanent president and its own permanent foreign minister, just like the United States of America has a U.S. president and its own secretary of state. Europe is now going to have its own. Well, that came to pass a couple of weeks after the final signing of the Constitution, because on November the 19th, 2009, Herman von Rompuy of Belgium was chosen to be the first permanent president of the European Union, and Catherine Ashton of Great Britain was chosen to be the first foreign minister. So here we are. The time has not arrived. Not everything is fully in place yet. We don't understand fully where the 10 nation union is going to come from, but we will see it very soon. So where are we and what does all this mean to you and me right now? What it means is that the prophesied rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire is now completed. Here you see in Revelation chapter 17, another picture of the Holy Roman Empire. 
only this time we have the world governmental system depicted as, as a beast having seven heads and ten horns. All of those have been explained in previous lessons here at End of the Age. However, it shows this woman, which is a symbol of the Vatican, riding on the back of this world government system. This will be the power of the Antichrist. It will be a union of politics and religion. Now, a lot of people are wondering, will the Antichrist possibly be a Muslim? Not according to this Holy Roman Empire prophecy. It clearly depicts that out of this ten nation union, remember the ten horns symbolized with the ten toes, it says that the Antichrist will come up among those, that there will be another horn that uproots three of those kings, and that man will be the Antichrist. This gives us absolute proof that the Antichrist will come out of the iron meal with clay, out of the beast ridden by the woman. Remember the picture outside the parliament building in Brussels, outside the parliament of the EU, Europa on the back of the bull, very much similar to what you're witnessing right now. So this shows us that on November the 3rd of 2009, the Holy Roman Empire was in fact reborn, just like the prophecy of Daniel 2, just like the prophecy of Revelation chapter 17. The Bible says it's during the, this era that Jesus Christ will come back to this earth, that the Antichrist will have his three and a half year reign, that the false prophet will rule with him, and that Jesus Christ will come. Well, the Holy Roman Empire is reborn today. My question, can the Antichrist and the false prophet be far behind?